I have recently purchased this pretty little thing here. I don't normally collect Roman Republican coins, but this one caught my eye for how delicate the die for the bust of Roma was sculpted in this deep, dark patina that gives the coin its very antique look. But this is not a video about how nice this coin looks. It is a video about how a young collector was once fooled. <laughs> now let's look at this horrible thing here. Five years ago when I was starting out, I thought this was just a cheap, very worn Republican denarius. I was buying my very first cast fake. Fortunately, it was a cheap mistake. 15 euros. What we have here is the most common type of modern counterfeit there is. A cast fake coin. They come in many, how can I say, quality levels. From very well-made ones that are somewhat hard to identify, to crude ones like this piece, which only really fools an absolute beginner. Like my collector self five years ago. I basically failed to take any kind of precautions before buying this thing. I was getting into a brand new niche of coinage without going on the internet and looking at reputable dealers or even at pictures on museum websites to see what a good coin actually looks like. I failed to look at the average prices for these kinds of coins. I would realize the price being asked was just too low and if something seems too good to be true, it likely is too good to be true. And instead of buying coins from a dealer that offered me a lifetime guarantee, I purchased it out of eBay. So, yeah, mistakes were made, many of them in quick succession. Since I don't want any of you, my subscribers, to fall for this kind of fake, we're going on a deep dive on how these fakes were made, what distinguishes them from a real coin, what to look for, this is a compl complimentary video to one I've made previously on how to detect fakes, which I'll leave a link in the description down below. That one was more of a good practices guide. In this case, we're going a bit deeper on the subject. In, in any case, I strongly recommend you also look at that video, because it gives you a basic plane of reference as to what to look for and how to avoid fakes overall. In case you don't want to delve deeper into fake detection like we're going to see in this video. Okay, let's jump right in. Before actually looking at the casting process, it's a good idea to review how the real coins were made. In the case for Roman and Greek coins, they were struck, because as you will see, its particular manufacture process has left its traces on the coin. Things that are hard to replicate on a cast coin, and these differences will be what we're looking for when looking for a fake. So for this, let's jump back 2000 years in the past and see how this denarius was made. So first, someone responsible for controlling the metal weight per coin made sure that flints weighing approximately 4 grams of silver were prepared. These blanks were then heated up, placed between two obverse and reverse ties, and struck with a strong hammer blow. This very flexible state of the metal when hot plus the sharp hammer blow means we will have a very quick displacement of the silver on the die to every hole and crevice on the die itself. I'm putting some diagrams on the screen so you can visualize this a bit better. Imagine looking at the coin from and the die from a cut through section at the side. Another analogy to that is if you imagine yourself punching a piece of soft clay. The clay will quickly displace away from your fist. In this case, some of the metal will flow outwards. Some will go towards the voids on the die that make up the design and will form the design on the coin. The coins were then thrown in water or oil to quickly cool them down. This would quickly solidify the hot and flexible metal into a hard metal disc with a very sharp looking design etched to it. So basically a coin. I have another coin here this denarius of Empress Faustina that illustrates how a le legit Roman denarius looks like right after minting, because it's in really good state. As you can see, every single detail is very sharply integrated into the flan. Looking at the border between Faustina's face and the dice, we can see a clear definition of what is the field part of the coin and what is her face. 
and we can still appreciate the lines radiating outwards, showing how quickly and violently, violently the silver was displaced outwards after the hammer strike. These are called flow lines. But it's not like you need to always look for flow lines to identify a struck coin. It's more nuanced than that. So for in the other denarius, for example, due to some harsher chemical cleaning, the flow lines are just gone, corroded away. Still, this is a perfectly authentic coin. The point I want to pass here is that the striking process creates sharpness. The design, even after some corrosion, still looks sharp because it was created with a strong strike. It still looks strongly imprinted on a coin flan. Even if we take a look at a very worn coin, like this Denarius of Julius Caesar, the wear this coin has suffered, which is considerable, still was not able to erase away the design elements because they were so deeply struck once the silver was hammered. Another very, very common result of the striking process are certain flaws the coin might develop after being struck by the hammer. You see, often the mint workers were a bit too enthusiastic on their job, or the, or the metal, the metal in the coin simply wasn't strong enough to handle the forces of the blow of the striking process, and a series of tears, ridges, defects would be formed. These come in the shapes of flan cracks, flan tears, and overall defects at the surface or at the rim of the coin. This might not always happen. So, for example, I'm showing you now a teta drachma that is, almost, that is perfectly authentic, but it has practically no issues around the rim. This is simply a result of a more thorough quality control in the manufacture of these coins, resulting on an even smooth-looking rim. However, if we look at this other teta drachma st struck under Emperor Claudius, we will see the rim has a series of stress fa fractures. This is another direct result of the transfer of forces from the hammer blow to the metal, squishing it and causing flaws, little tears at the edges of the coin. And that's a good sign of an authentic struck piece. That's one of the criticisms I have with slabbing companies. Looking at the rim of a coin is actually quite important for authenticating it, and the slabs generally obscure the sport. You should, as a numismatist, really get used to looking at a coin's rim. And the most common types of defects you will see in coins are flan cracks and flan splits. Let's look at this example from Emperor Diocletian. If you look at the upper part, the 12 o'clock in this coin, this is a flan crack, a stress fracture that goes nearly all the way to the center of the coin and is a direct result of a coin being struck. It is impossible for a cast coin to have a crack like this, which we will explain why in a little bit. Alternatively, a coin might not develop a crack, but the edge of the coin might not resist the pressure and split like a tear, almost like tearing a piece of fabric. This big Byzantine follis here has a series of flan splits. Look around the edges. It is literally like a tear on the coin's rim. And here, in this Antoninianus, we have a similar situation. It is full of tears around the rim. It actually has some cracks too, giving it this ragged appearance. This coin didn't fare very well in the striking process, but by merely looking at this piece, we can see it has all of the signs of a perfectly authentic struck coin. Okay, enough with the legit stuff. Let's look at the fakes themselves. There are tons of ways to fake coins, but I decided to dedicate this video to cast fakes because they are the most common. And that is due to the fact it is cheap to cast a fake. Let's remember a counterfeiter's objective is to make money. And the more refined the technique is, the more expensive it is. Are there fakes of affordable coins? Of course there are, but fortunately, this also means that generally, only affordable faking te techniques will be used to fake more affordable coins, which means they should be easier to detect. So, what is a cast fake? For that, maybe we'll need some more drawings and diagrams, but the principle is very simple. You get a real coin, 
and you make a negative impression of it in some sort of material medium, maybe on sand, silicon, you basically create a space with the shape of the coin and you fill it up with molten metal, aiming to get as an end result a coin similar to an authentic struck coin. Of course, this process is completely different to striking a coin, so there are a series of key differences to the end product of a cast fake, even for refined casting techniques. Fortunately, that awful Republican tinnitus of mine has all of the telltale signs of a fake, so we will be able to use it as a perfect example. The first thing to know is that a cast fake will have a soft, soapy, fuzzy texture. Instead of having the die quickly imprint the design on the flan with this violent hammer blow, the design will be slowly formed by the metal flowing into the crevices of the negative space of the mold. The molten metal will never reach all of the little spaces and the material the mold is made out of, sand for example, will never capture the design of the original with total sharpness. As you can see here in this coin, the bust of Roma and Castor and Pollux on the reverse have this have this soft, have this undefined look to them. If we go to the reverse of this authentic Denarius, however, we can notice there's a big difference. Mind you, this Denarius has some wear to it, the high points are worn off, but as you can see, it is a night and day difference. The image is sharp, it is clearly distinguishable. On the topic of the metal not filling all the crevices of the mold, remember those flan splits I was talking about? There is this funny phenomena where the coin used to make the mold might have had a flan crack or a split. The shape of these flaws was transferred to the mold, but the metal doesn't fully fill these spaces. This might result in some weird ridges on the coin, or coins with a partially filled, weird-looking flan split, something that looks like a flan split, but has this semi-filled state. This is particularly common with sand-based molds, where the grains of sand or clay don't fully imitate the shape of the crack. Another thing with cast coins is that for the metal to get in and fill the negative spaces of the, the mold, the air in that space needs to come out, and it doesn't always come out fully. Once more, looking at our fake here, we can see that it has small bumps, like little holes. These are very common with cast fakes, and are a result of trapped air between the molten metal and the mold material. So, even if a fake was made with high-quality mold materials, it's very, very hard to get all of the air out and some of it will show up, particularly in small crevices on the design, such as the legends or the space where the design meets the fields. Keep an eye out for any bubbly textures, some round or misshapen formations where nothing should be there. Next, let's talk about weight. Metals were expensive back then, particularly so precious metals, therefore the weight of the coin was tightly controlled. A coin of a certain time should have a certain weight, and unless it is very corroded or damaged, it should not deviate a whole lot. A Republican denarius like this one, considering a little bit of wear, should have between 3.6-3.9 grams. You'll find one that shows very little wear, but weights, let's say, only 3 grams? That's a reason to worry. The thing is, when you cast a coin, the metal needs to be so hot that it is liquid. So, time for some physics. What, ha what happens when you heat up something? It expands. Therefore, its density decreases. So, when you pour molten metal in a space that was occupied previously by a solid, denser, heavier metal, once your fake coin cools down, it will shrink, it will be a bit smaller and lighter than the original piece used to make the mold. This pathetic excuse of a denarius I bought, with 1.9 grams, I'm sure this bastard isn't even silver. That's why a jeweler scale is a must-have for any collector. Next, let's remember, after the counterfeiter has cast the coins, he must remove it from the mold. 
This means that the mold will have to be made out of two parts, where these parts meet up generally at the coin's rim or near the rim. A perfect seal is impossible to be achieved, resulting in a small seam being present. If we look at our coin here, it doesn't seem to have a seam, although it, had this it has this odd sharp edge to it. That is because many, pe many people shave the rim to erase the little ridge. But of course, this will leave some sort of scratch mark, or in this case, a square border on the rim instead of a more quote-unquote natural looking rim. Once more, get used to looking at your coin's rims. It is a vital part of authenticating struck coins. If you can identify an authentic looking rim, the likelihood of being fooled is generally greatly reduced. Finally, many counterfeiters will try to give the coin an antique appearance after manufacturing the fake. This comes in the shape of giving it some sort of patina, otherwise the coin will have the appearance of a brand new shining silver coin. This might be achieved with a series of techniques with chemicals, I won't get into many details here. I'll instead add a series of images of artificial patinas applied to fake coins. A patina takes time to form. So all of these quick solutions just look odd, look exaggerated or just plain wrong. Of course, you won't know what a legit patina looks like without seeing a lot of good legit patinas. That's why I always say that the best defense against fake coins is looking at a ton of good coins and knowing what a good coin should look like. And in case you still haven't seen my first video on fakes and have no idea on how to quote unquote get exposure to good coins, I explained it all there, so once more, head there and watch it. Cast fakes are the most common type of fakes out there, but fortunately, as you people can see from this presentation, it isn't very hard to detect them. Even for someone who just recently started out on ancient coins, with a little bit of exposure to good coins and some due diligence, these are pretty easy to detect and avoid. So I hope this was a useful guide. Make sure to, to leave your own tips on how to detect fakes in the comment section down below. So remember to like, subscribe, happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.